Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Grand Rounds. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Ash, second of two terrific chief medical residents here at UWMC. This is Sam as an acromegalic. <laughs> always, uh, always thriving to be bigger than he was at the moment. And uh, this is a harbinger of his prowess as a skier. He's a terrific skier. This is an important picture here. This show, shows Sam as a young man. It shows that he has an affinity for the Boston Red Sox. He's actually returning to Boston as a fellow now this upcoming July in pulmonary critical care. It also illustrates two more important things here. One, that he learned the importance of a good breakfast. And <clears throat> this will allow me to introduce one of two very important women in his life, uh, Dr. Sarah Ash, his mom, who's up here in the front. You need to stand up here because... <laughs> now, uh, now, she's very important to this presentation for two reasons. One. Uh, she's a professor of nutrition, and she introduced Sam to the important concept of starting every day with a good, healthy breakfast. And she starts every day with the following. <laughs> it's actually, I, I, I'd like to point out, it's actually usually a regular cup. Ah, oh, well, I thought she was a professor <laughs> of nutrition, so. I'm not sure that Sam started today with his proper breakfast, but this is how he starts his day, which is with strawberry pop tarts. That's true. Thank you. I appreciate that. You have to. The second important part is that uh, you'll see that Sam has a twinkle in his eye and an impish smile. He's got a wicked sense of humor. He's come by this honestly. And all of these slides came courtesy of his wife and his mom. And I just want to show you a quick flash of his future leadership abilities here. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> that was uh, a quick flash of Sam as a uh, camp counselor and showing that he was soon to be an esteemed leader. This is uh, another demonstration of Sam's sense of humor. This is his Halloween costume at about uh, age 10 or 11. And he's dressed as dad in the morning. If I can go back one slide, I just want to point out one other thing here, which I noticed this morning. Down at the base of his feet there is a six-pack of beer. <laughs> All right. So uh, one more thing about Sam. He grew up in the uh, land of first flight, the Wright brothers, in North Carolina. And Sam is a spectacular pilot. Before he came to medical school or to residency, he was a commercial pilot and could fly virtually any plane. And here he is in his first solo flight uh, over the uh, land of the southeast. After leaving North Carolina, uh, Sam went on to matriculate at Yale University, where he won several awards, including the best senior thesis for uh, his topic on Jetson's chauffeur, uh, the flying car and the American dream. And he also won a service award for humanitarianism at Yale and then went to Columbia Medical School, where he got his first introduction to one of today's two topics, which is night medicine. Now, Katie tells me his favorite place to study was on the couch. And here is Sam doing a little night medicine. <laughs> so the other important woman in Sam's life is Katie, up here in the front row, sitting next to Dr. Ash. Uh, he and Katie went up to Alaska, spent one of their favorite months together in residency. Katie's a pediatrician, and the two of them went up there and spent a month uh, as a rotation residency, and here they are at one of the lakes up there. Now, one of the other very important attributes of Sam is he's a polyglot. He speaks Russian well, and here he is in our last slide. He's about to fly off into the future, and I can think of no better person to be the pilot of our American medical care system. And for that, and his wonderful work as a chief medical resident, I say spasiba. Thank you. All right. I'm glad there was no longer slide of me shirtless. Um, thank you so much for having me today. It's really an incredible honor to speak to this audience and to give grand rounds. Before we get started, no financial disclosures. Um, I don't know if you were expecting any. 
This is what I call the Mo Hagman slide. Mo always told us to tell them what you're going to talk about, talk about it, and then uh, tell them what you talked about. So this is the I'm going to tell you what I'm about to talk about slide. It, as most of you know, the UW chief residents split their year into two halves, the active clinical half, where we organize conferences, TJ morning report, and probably most importantly, where we distribute pastries to the residents, and then the other half where we do have the opportunity to do research. Like that, my grand rounds today will be split into two halves, the first half on pulmonary fibrosis, spend a little bit of time on background, and then a fair amount of time on TGF-beta and everything you ever wanted to know about integrins. Then the second half on night medical education and work that Amanda Stepper and I have been doing on our night medical curriculum, as well as uh, an st ongoing study of our night medical experience. Diving right in, pulmonary fibrosis. The first thing to say about pulmonary fibrosis is that it's a catch-all term. It's a pathophysiologic outcome, and it can occur in response to a wide variety of injuries, radiation, a variety of medications, including chemotherapeutics like bleomycin, and also occurs in a variety of disease processes, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other interstitial lung diseases. I spend the bulk of the time talking about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This definition is adapted from the ATS Joint Statement on Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis. IPF is a chronic progressive fibrosing pneumonia. It's limited to the lungs. By definition, it occurs primarily in older adults and is characterized by a radiographic or histopathologic evidence of usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP. We'll come back to UIP here in a minute. IPF occurs more frequently in men. Uh, as noted in the definition, the rates increase with age. There are a variety of environmental triggers that have been looked at, too, that are fairly well established, are cigarette smoking and exposure to metal and wood dust. There's growing interest in the role of GERD, both in the pathogenesis of the disease and as a cause for its progression. And there are familial types as well. As mentioned, the definition, IPF is a progressive disease. There are a few different ways that it can progress. There is a rapid progressive course here that's usually associated with patients who are smokers. There's patients who have IPF and coexisting emphysema who also progress relatively rapidly. Then there are the patients that we're familiar with here at the UW, either in the MICU or on the wards, who are admitted with acute exacerbations that may resolve or that may cause clinical decompensation and eventually death. IPF, as we all know, is not particularly good for you. A median survival of 2.5 to 3.5 years after diagnosis. And unfortunately, it's challenging to treat. This again from the ATS joint statement that our own Dr. Ragu has been heavily involved in regarding the treatment of IPF, and I quote, the committee did not find sufficient evidence to support the use of any specific pharmacologic therapy for patients with IPF. All is not lost. However, clinical trials of some agents have suggested possible benefit. We're going to spend the rest of the pulmonary fibrosis portion of this talk talking about potential new and novel therapies for pulmonary fibrosis. We're all familiar with this experience. So let's come back to the pathology of IPF and usual interstitial pneumonia. What you see here on the top are characteristic CAT scans from a patient with IPF. And the arrows pointing out the subpleural honeycombing and the particular opacities with the basal predominance that's characteristic of the disease. On the bottom, you see the histopathological correlate with these fibroblastic foci that are closely associated with relatively normal lung. The central cellular mediator, or one of the central cellular mediators of pulmonary fibrosis, are fibroblasts and their activated counterpart, the myofibroblasts. They're involved in the deposition of extracellular matrix protein and in contraction, as well as a number of other things. If, uh, if fibroblasts are the central cellular mediator, then TGF-beta is one of the central pro-fibrotic cytokines and has a variety of effects. It, causes local migration and proliferation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, as well as works as a chemoattractant to stimulate 
distant fiber sites to move to these fibroblastic foci, and also stimulates what's called epithelial to mesenchymal transition, transitioning epithelial cells to fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. There's a variety of other pro-fibrotic effects. It stimulates the production of matrix proteins by mesenchymal cells, including fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. Decreases the synthesis of metalloproteases, which break down that extracellular matrix protein, which results in increased deposition of it. It also sensitizes fibroblasts and maintains them in an activated state and prevents myofibroblasts from undergoing apoptosis, thereby prolonging their survival. I'll we'll just note there are three mammalian forms of TGF beta uh, TGF beta 1, 2, and 3. For the most part, when I'm referring to TGF beta for the rest of the talk, we'll be primarily talking about TGF beta 1. In terms of evidence that active TGF beta induces fibrosis, what you see here on the left side of the screen are slides, specimens from rat lung, seven days and 14 days after the exposure to a profibrotic agent, bleomycin. And you can see if you hold your mouth just right, there may be a small amount of fibrosis, but it's not overwhelming. We do the same thing in rats who have upregulation of TGF beta via uh, viral transfection. You see dramatically increased fibrosis, as evidenced by this mature scar here and the large amount of deposition of extracellular matrix protein. So, increasing the expression of TGF beta increases pulmonary fibrosis. In terms of blocking TGF beta to de decrease fibrosis, again, what you see here on the left side is uh, this, in this case, a mouse lung after exposure to bleomycin and a mouse treated with a control antibody. And you can see it's a little bit hard to pick up, but this is all fibrosis here, this sort of dark, dense area. If you treat these mice with an anti-TGF beta antibody, there is significantly less fibrosis. There's small fibroblastic foci down here, or focus down here. The rest of the lung is relatively preserved. So this raises the question, if pulmonary fibrosis is challenging to treat and if our current therapies are not particularly effective in affecting its progressive course, could we perhaps target TGF-beta or the activation of TGF-beta in order to treat the disease? It turns out we might be able to. There are a variety of medications or agents that are currently in development to target TGF-beta or TGF-beta's activation in order to potentially treat pulmonary fibrosis. We'll go through a few of these. GC1008 is an anti-TGF beta antibody. It's an IgG4 antibody. It targets TGF beta 1, 2, and 3. It's completed, completed phase 1 clinical trials. The results, to the best of my knowledge, are still pending, and there are significant concerns about targeting TGF beta itself. It has a wide variety of homeostatic roles in the body and functions as a tumor suppressor. SD108 is a small molecule inhibitor of a TGF beta receptor that's been shown to be effective in blocking fibrotic expression TGF beta overexpression studies. Imatinib, I think most of us are familiar with in the treatment of Philadelphia chromosome positive CML and the treatment of GIST. Uh, it's also shown in animal models to be effective in preventing, preventing the progression of pulmonary fibrosis. Unfortunately, in a recent multicenter phase three trial, there was no effective imatinib in terms of survival or in terms of disease progression in patients with moderate pulmonary fibrosis. And then finally, losartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker. There's interest in the role of the renin angiotensin system as a Fibrotic system and studies on losartan are ongoing. I'll spend the rest of the time talking about anti integrin therapies and integrins. So, what are integrins? Integrins are heterodimeric transmembrane proteins. They consist of an alpha subunit and a beta subunit, and they're expressed in a wide variety of tissues. Some of you may be familiar with alpha 2B beta, alpha 2B beta 3 integrins, a little bit of a mouthful, uh, which is implicated in Glanzmann thrombocenia. Or, in, uh, or with integrin beta 2, which has been implicated in leukocyte adhesion deficiency. We're going to talk mostly about integrins and their role in TGF beta activation. There are several integrins that are involved in TGF beta activation. We'll talk mostly about alpha V beta 6 integrin and alpha 8 beta 1 integrin, which I will uh, 
also referred to as alpha-8 integrin. Let's talk about TGF-beta activation. So TGF-beta activation can occur in a number of ways. It can occur uh, via metalloproteases or via this mechanism that we're about to go through. TGF-beta is frequently secreted as latent TGF-beta bound to this latency-associated peptide. I have an epithelial cell here, but TGF-beta can be secreted by a wide variety of cell types. I draw your attention to integrins here, those transmembrane proteins that form a link between stress fibers within the fibroblast and the latent TGF-beta binding protein, which itself is stuck onto the extracellular matrix. So as you can see, latent TGF-beta is secreted bound to latency-associated peptide, which is in turn bound to the latent TGF-beta binding protein, all of which makes up what's called the large latent complex. In response to mechanical traction, the stress fibers contract or expand, and that transmits force via integrins to the latent TGF-beta binding protein, which causes a conformational change in the latency-associated peptide, this guy here, which releases latent TGF-beta and allows it to activate and act on the TGF-beta receptor. This is a rate-limiting step in terms of TGF-beta's biologic activity. And so the question becomes, could we block TGF-beta activation and thereby decrease its effects and potentially decrease the progression of pulmonary fibrosis? This has been done with alpha-V beta-6 integrin. Alpha-V beta-6 integrin is actually primarily expressed on injured lung epithelium as involved in the initiation of fibrosis. And what you see here on the y-axis is per percent fibrosis area of mice lungs who have been exposed to a radiation-induced model of lung fibrosis. The first column on the x-axis are those mice treated with a control antibody. And then these next four columns are mice who have been treated with an anti-alpha-V beta-6 antibody. You can see a significant reduction in the percent fibrosis area. This has been replicated in other models of fibrosis by others, including Dean Shepard, using an antibody targeting alpha-V beta-6 integrin in a bleomycin model of pulmonary fibrosis. And if it works in mice, maybe it works in humans. It's currently undergoing this drug, uh, STX100, which is an anti-alpha-V beta-6 antibody, is currently undergoing phase two clinical trials, which we hope to have results of soon. Anti-alpha-V beta-6 integrin, important in the initiation of fibrosis and potentially a therapeutic target. What I've been working on with Lynn Schnapp and Shi Hung and others in Lynn's lab is a potentially complementary approach to the treatment of pulmonary fibrosis with an integrin called alpha-8 beta-1 integrin, which we believe is important in the progression of pulmonary fibrosis. Alpha-8 beta-1 integrin is expressed on fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. Here you see immunofluorescence of uh, rat lung fibroblasts. And you can see the alpha-8 subunit of alpha-8 beta-1 integrin here. So our central question has been, is alpha-8 integrin important in the activation of TGF-beta? And if blocking it, can we, and if we block it, can we prevent the progression of pulmonary fibrosis? Lynn and others have previously shown that alpha-8 integrin is important in the adhesion to, this is latent TGF-beta. What I've been working on is its role in the activation of TGF-beta. In order to do this, we've been using a conditional knockout of alpha-8 integrin. Um, turns out that alpha-8 integrin is important in other organs, such as the kidneys, which are not the lungs, but I'm told are still important. Um, and so if you knock out alpha-8 integrin entirely, mice don't develop normally. So, We've been using our mice in which the alpha integrin is knocked out in particular cell types that are most associated with um, mesenchymal cells. And here is just real-time PCR data showing that our knockout works. So what you see on the y-axis is normalized expression. And as you can see, in our knockout mice, there's significantly less expression of alpha integrin as compared to the wild-type control. So our knockout works. What about its effect in TG, on TGF-beta activity? Here what you see is uh, TGF-beta activity as reported by normalized luminescence. So uh, 
uh, one of the ways that we measure TGF beta activity is we take the mouse lung fibroblasts, which are making TGF beta or activating TGF beta, and we co culture them with mink lung epithelial cells that have been transfected with the firefly luciferase gene so that they luminesce in response to TGF beta. And we take the luminescence as a surrogate marker of TGF beta activity. So, what you see here on the y axis are these relative luminescence units. And the first column here are the, is the TGF beta activity in our conditional knockouts, and the second column in our wild type controls. As you can see, there's significantly less. TGF beta activation in our knockout as compared to our wild type control, suggesting again that alpha eta integrate is important in the activation of TGF beta. Next thing, can we block alpha eta integrin and also have the same effect? Nick Mark, who also has been working with Lynn, has shown this in our lab, and we'll walk through this graph here for a moment. So, what you see again on the y axis is normalized luminescence. And the first column is our negative control. These are mouse lung fibroblasts that are cultured in serum-free media. The next column is our positive control. These are mouse lung fibroblasts that are cultured in media that has bovine serum, fetal bovine serum, which should increase TGF beta production. And then the last column, this white column, are those same mouse lung fibroblasts that have been cultured in media containing bovine serum with the addition of an anti-alpha-8 integrant antibody. What you can see is a statistically significant decrease in the luminescence and the TGF beta activity with the blockade of alpha-8 integrant. So what do we know? What's previously been known and shown is that alpha-8 integrant mediates adhesion to latent TGF beta. And we've shown recently that this conditional knockout results in decreased TGF beta activation. We've also shown that blockade of alpha-8 beta-1 integrin results in decreased TGF beta activation. And she and others are working on ongoing research as to the phenotype of these alpha-8 beta-1 integrin knockouts or blockade. So in conclusion, with regard to the basic science portion of our talk, TGF beta has a central role in IPF, and integrins, including alpha-8 beta-1 integrin, are important in the activation of TGF beta. And they may prove to be novel therapies targeting TGF beta in the future. You can imagine that there may be complementary approaches targeting both alpha V beta 6 integrin, which is involved in the initiation of fibrosis, and also targeting alpha A beta 1 integrin, which is involved in the progression of fibrosis or perpetuation of it. Okay. Night medicine. Here we go. We've always taken care of patients at night. Uh, we didn't just close the hospital and go home. Um, but in 2011, the ACGME defined something new. They defined night medicine. They did this at the same time they limited interns to 16 hours of continuous duty. And they specifically differentiated night medicine from night float. So what is night medicine? Night medicine is a rotation or a service that involves significant faculty member interaction, so our nocturne is here, involves input into ongoing patient care, involves advancing patient care, and it includes, importantly for us, a defined curriculum with goals and objections, goals and objectives. The residents have some objections to the curriculum. As res residents in the room have heard me say over and over again, night medicine is not night flow. Night medicine is not night float. Night medicine is not night float. And this is not just keeping patients alive so that the morning team can come in and figure out what the devil happened. This is advancing care and learning while you're doing it. Why is that important? Night float rotations have not traditionally included formal educational opportunities. We know this anecdotally. We also know this from data. This is survey data from a study that Andy Lux and Joyce Whip and others did at Harborview just a few years ago where they surveyed residents on night float rotations and non-night ro float rotations and asked them to rank their ability in terms of uh, their opportunity to go to resident report sessions and grand round sessions attended per week. You can see they were unable to attend resident report sessions. And Bill, I tried to find a picture of you frowning, but there are no pictures of you frowning. They were also weren't able to come to grand rounds, which is sad for all of us. That's observational data. Um, we like observational data. Observational data is good. Uh, we also like randomized controlled trials. 
This is a study that was recently completed by Sanjay Desai and others at Hopkins, and they received approval from the ACGME to randomize interns to three different groups. The first group is the traditional Q4 model, where you stay 30 hours overnight every fourth night. The second group, I'm not going to dwell on, but it was this somewhat complicated, what they called Q5 model, it's not really what I would think of as Q5, where the interns would work a day, work a day, then sleep in, go get their nails done, and then come in late in the day, do a 16-hour night shift, then go home the next day, sleep, and then keep working. And then the night float model. This is similar to our cardiology model here at UWMC, where you work days, and then you switch and you work nights. We're going to focus on the differences between the control model and the night float model. I should say they did not in this study add any formal night curriculum, but they did arrange the schedule such that the uh, night float residents were able to go to the morning teaching that they considered to be the most important part of their educational curriculum. These are just a few of their results. Again, if you sort of focus on the differences between night float and the control group, these are ratings on a five-point Likert scale, um, the residents were significantly less satisfied with their education on the night float model and with their sense of team membership on the night float model. They didn't study this, um, but there is another finding that we've had here anecdotally from Kelly Corning in terms of the effects of switching to night float. Apparently, um, with the interns being able to go home at night, we've also seen an uptick in the number of pregnancies in the program. Um, Take that or leave that. Um, as Brad mentioned, I'm from North Carolina, so I actually don't know how that happens because I didn't have a health class. Um, OK, so this is a problem. This is, uh, this is an issue. And um, Amanda and I set out to try to fix this here at UW. And we wanted to create a formal night medicine curriculum to try to tackle some of these issues. Our goals in creating the night medicine curriculum were to provide teaching on core night medicine or, or call topics, things that come up frequently overnight, to enhance this sense of, of night community, to really enhance a, a sense of team membership at night, and overall to help transform night float into night medicine. We patterned it after Morning Report, which is Amanda and my favorite conference. And also, for those of you who have clinic at Roosevelt or the VA after a pretty clinic conference, and we'll talk about what that looked like. There are 30-minute sessions starting at 1.30 in the morning. They happen six days a week and occur in the cardiology A team room, which is a geographically central area. They're multidisciplinary, so the hemoc night team, the medicine night team, the cardiology night team, the MICU night team, everyone's there. And all residents and interns are expected to attend. We have three types of conference, night report, core call conference, and formal nocturnist didactics. Night report happens Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Core call conference on Wednesdays, and formal nocturnist didactics on Sundays. Night report is the morning report style conference. It's a case-based presentation. We ask that the intern or resident come prepared to talk about a case and talk about a few learning points that they have from that case. It's very informal, there's no PowerPoint, it's usually at the whiteboard or sitting around in a circle, and the nocturne is sort of guides the discussion. Core call conference is this preclinic conference based idea where we have uh, pre made or prepared, for Brad who doesn't like the term pre made, uh, case based presentations. Um, faculty, the faculty who are in the audience, we're always looking for more if you'd like to prepare materials. We have several of them. Um, they cover topics seen commonly overnight, such as the acute management of septic shock or uh, hypercalcemia, things like that. And then one night a week of formal nocturnist teaching that rotates between the medicine nocturnist, hemoc nocturnist, and cardiology nocturnist. We started out the year wanting to include Naivasha, Kenya. As many of you know, we now have a chief resident in Naivasha. This is a photo of their first ever morning report. Naivasha is about 10 hours time difference, so we thought that the timing might work out. We learned a few things, though, over the course of the year. It turns out Kenya does not go on daylight savings time. That caused a little bit of trouble. And uh, we're still working on some of the technical kinks, but that's, that's coming. 
this is great, and we're, we were very happy to do this, but we're wondering if it actually worked or if it actually did anything. And our, our question was and is, does the implementation of a formal curriculum improve resident perceptions of their night medical education? Did this via an anonymous online survey of all the residents who completed rotations that have a night component? This will actually extend into the 2013-2014 academic year. The survey was adapted from one that was used at Wayne State by Bricker and Marquette looking at resident perceptions of night float rotations. We're making comparisons between residents who did these night rotations before and after the implementation of the curriculum, which happened March 1st, or excuse me, March 4th of this year. And we're also making comparisons with uh, those residents who rotate at Harborview. So Harborview has exceptional informal night medicine teaching, but no formal curriculum as of yet, so they are a control group. This study is approved by the UW IRB. Before we get to the quantitative results, I want to take a moment on the qualitative results, because these are equally as important to Amanda and to me. This is a photo of a night resident pre-implementation of the curriculum. <laughs> We'd say a lot of things about uh, what JP looks like in this photo. Um, the one thing that I do want to really point out, though, is that he's alone. He's all alone, and he's very sad about it. Um, and I'm not sure if Night Medicine put him to sleep, but I will point out that there's a McGee uh, on the desk there, and he's not very far into it. I, don't know. I really like that book. I really enjoy it. So this is pre-implementation, post-implementation. This is what night medicine looks like. There's a team. People are enjoying themselves. Someone's at the whiteboard teaching. You can see Alicia here has a smile on her face. She doesn't seem to be paying attention. <laughs> but she has a smile on her face nonetheless, which is good. And really, this is what we're after. We're after uh, improving the resident perceptions of their night medical education, improving eventually their competency with regard to taking care of issues at night. We also want to make this a more enjoyable experience and improve the team mentality that um, is lacking a little bit in the new system. OK, so quantitative results. First, our response rate. Not terrible for UW. Thank you, UW residents. 44%, not awful. Um, as I said, the curriculum rolled out in, uh, and I should say these numbers are as of about a week and a half ago. Um, the curriculum rolled out March 4th, so we certainly have more pre-implementation than post-implementation numbers at the moment, but the study's ongoing. Harborview, um, I don't really know what to say, uh, but I will not comment on our Harborview results beyond just uh, this for the moment, because I think the numbers are really too low to draw any conclusions as of yet. Okay, so numbers. This is a lot of data, and we'll walk through it one step at a time here. Draw your attention first to the opportunity to attend didactic sessions. And again, this is on a five-point Likert scale, with one being uh, bad or felt like they didn't have much opportunity, and five being great or wonderful. And you can see residents now feel, after the implementation of a formal night medicine curriculum, that they have the opportunity to attend didactic sessions and conferences at night, which is great. That was one of the main things that we wanted to get out of creating this curriculum. We've also improved the overall quality of the formal didactic teaching at night. So before, rated as a 2.2, and now as a 3.83, and statistically significant. What we've not done is we've not changed the overall educational value, at least not yet, of the rotation or the overall quality of the rotation. Obviously, we'd like to improve the overall quality of the rotation. We'd like to improve the educational value of it. I will say, though, that I'm glad that we didn't see a decline in the quality of the education at night. And you know, we chuckle about it, but it could happen. For those of us who really value informal teaching, if you felt that formal teaching took away from informal teaching, or if you felt like having this conference in some way uh, impaired your ability to take care of patients at night, then you could see a drop off in the overall quality of the rotation. And we don't see that, which I think is a good thing. Had a couple of other interesting preliminary findings. Before the implementation of the curriculum, residents said that the most useful or educational learning opportunity was informal teaching. This small doesn't really project very well. This is formal teaching by the nocturnists. 
after the implementation of the curriculum, what the residents found the most useful and the most educational is formal teaching by the nocturnists. I had a similar finding in terms of enjoyable learning. I'll point out this red only shows up on this graph. Uh, apparently, the residents never found the resident teaching to be particularly useful. Um, they used to find it to be enjoyable. Um, <laughs> and now they mostly find formal teaching by the nocturnists to be enjoyable. Um, not really sure what that says, but it is interesting that the residents now find different learning opportunities to be enjoyable. And I'll, I'll point out about this, um, this brings me back to that the important point that we did not change the overall educational quality. So we're simply changing what uh, residents find to be enjoyable and useful, not the overall educational quality or the value of the rotation. So in conclusion, with regard to night medicine education, uh, night medicine curriculum provides access to formal teaching. It changes the educational opportunities that are the most useful and the most enjoyable. I think qualitatively and importantly, it improves resident morale. That's it. I have a lot of acknowledgments, sort of at the Oscars. I want to thank everyone. Um, first and foremost, the greatest house staff in the known universe. Y'all are amazing. That's why I get up every morning. Uh, Bill, Brad, Ken, Doug, sort of the, my four bosses this year, all of whom are wonderful. Lynn, um, thank you for involving me in your lab when the first day I literally had to learn how to use a pipette, um, which was mildly traumatic. Um, and she and I did not burn down the lab. So that's good that one day you guys weren't there. Um, Eric, who I worked with with some coaxymetry work, and John on pneumococcus work, uh, John Amory and Andrew White, and then you can see the others. Most importantly, Amanda and my co-chiefs, and obviously my wife and my mom. So thank you very much.